This week on Intrigued, Full Effect. If you knew her, you couldn't help but to love her. She is very helpful. Relisha is very, very respectful. And I mean, she, at such a young age, she learned how to take care of her brothers. She was always helping her mom with her brothers. It's nothing Relisha wouldn't do for nobody. You know, if she see you having a bad day, she would put a smile on your face. I'm Shandrea Thomas, and welcome to episode 12. In this podcast, I talk about curious cases, disappearances, and other stuff. And today I'm talking about the curious case and disappearance of eight-year-old Relisha Rudd from Washington, D.C. This disappearance also happened while Relisha and her family were living at a D.C. shelter. And this particular case is shrouded in mystery, and the community is left with more questions than answers. The story led to a nationwide search, news coverage, and more. The family even made an appearance on the Steve Wilco show and took lie detector tests to try and find answers about what happened to Relisha. And from what I could tell, there seemed to be a lot of finger pointing about who's to blame in this case. There's so much to get to, so I'll just dive in and go from there. I reached out to Relisha's grandmother and police about this complicated and unforgettable case. And another thing to note is that some of the details in the case are sketchy, so I will do my best to piece this all together. This is what happened. According to a WUSA special report, March 1st, 2014 was the last time Relisha was seen alive by her mother. The report also says that Relisha's mother, Shamika Young, took the 8-year-old shopping and then left her with her grandmother, Melissa Young, and another relative and that she had no idea that her daughter was gone until 18 days later. Fast forward to March 19th. According to relatives, that's when a school social worker realized that fake absence letters were actually being written by someone named Dr. Tatum to cover Relisha's time out of school. And that's when some major red flags went off and an Amber Alert was put out. The official search for Relisha was on, and as the investigation kicked into high gear, detectives discovered that on February 26th, Relisha was captured on surveillance video with 51-year-old Khalil Tatum at a Holiday Inn Express at the 1900 block of Bladensburg Road in Northeast D.C. The FBI released that surveillance video to the public, and in the video you can see she's holding bags and walking into a hotel room with Tatum, but police never released details on when or how she left that room. At the same time, Relisha's family was living at the D.C. General Family Shelter, where Tatum also worked as a janitor. According to reports and family members, Tatum had developed a close relationship with Relisha's mother at the shelter and took Relisha to his home on occasion. So with all of that, I really needed to get some more details on what happened between March the 1st and March 19th. So I spoke to Relisha's grandmother, Melissa Young, about the timeline of events leading to the disappearance. This is what she had to say. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. I know that you guys have been really trying to figure out, you know, this big mystery surrounding what happened to Relisha. So yes. for people who, yes, so for, for people who may not be familiar with her case, can you explain to me what happened with her? Mm-hmm. Well, what happened with Relisha, um, her, Relisha, her mom, stepdad, and three brothers entered D.C. General Shelter in 2012. Prior to becoming a resident there, she was allowed to go and visit um, Khalil Tatum, who was a janitor at the shelter. She would go have playdates with his granddaughter. Um... Everything was going fine up until March the 19th when she disappeared with Khalil Tatum. Let me ask you this. Okay, so on March the 19th, what happened on that day or what prompted the whole mystery behind her disappearance? What happened? That's something I've been trying to figure out because on that day, she actually called me and her aunt. She, Her and Khalil called us twice. One, one time at um, 9 o'clock in the morning, I believe, and then another time at around 11 in the afternoon when she called that morning, um, he was informing us that him and Relisha had just prepared a breakfast and that he was going to meet me to bring her to me that afternoon, which that never happened. So I don't know what transpired for him to keep 
going with Relisha. There was an 18-day gap between the last time Relisha's mother says she saw her and the official search. I asked Melissa what happened in that time frame. Okay, so let me back up a little bit because I know people were um, curious as to, you know, that whole time period where uh, Relisha was missing a lot of school. So there were supposedly these 18 days where she was unaccounted for. Can you explain what was going on with that? What was the situation? Okay, um, from, well, I took her to the hospital February the 10th, prior, before she went missing. She was supposed to have been suffering from a real bad um, headache. She does have asthma real bad where she requires medication for that. Um, the only reason why she was suffering with headaches is because um, her father, he has seizures, so we don't know what's prompting you know, her to have those severe headaches, and that's why she was out of school. When I took her to the emergency room on February the 10th, I kept her from February the 10th until February the 26th. And that's when she went to her aunt's house um, and then from there, her mom picked her up and we don't know, you know, how everything went from there. Well, so basically on the 26th, that's when Relisha went back to the shelter with her mom or wherever. And then you she guys was, had, that was the last time. Yeah, she was actually up her auntie's house on the 26th and her mom went over there on the, um, the from the 26th to the 1st of March. She was there and her mom went and picked her up on the first from what, you know, the information that they told me and was supposed to have been taking Relisha shopping and taking her to get her hair and nails done. She never did that. What she did was took, picked her up and um, took her to meet Mr. Tatum so that she supposedly had a play date with his granddaughter on that day. Okay. So then after March the 1st, what happened after that? No one seen her. No one in the family seen her after that. Okay, so if, if basically the last time the mom picked her up, that was March the 1st, and yes. then on March the 19th is when the official search for her started. Yeah, because of the social worker from Payne Elementary showed up at the shelter looking for a Dr. Tatum. What, that was put on me also. Shamika told them that I had gave the school that name said that Khalil was a doctor and that I wrote falsified notes. Once they checked that out, they saw I didn't write no type of notes. Oh, wow. So the mystery of, of where these notes came from, it's that had nothing. Un- exactly. It's still unknown. So do you think he wrote the notes? I mean, to try to cover time? Right. And that's what I'm thinking, too. But I haven't even seen the notes. I wanted to see the notes. They wouldn't even show me the notes. In your mind, what do you think happened? To be honest, I mean, I, I mean, I didn't really notate him like that. So to, I don't, to, to me, I don't know what, I can't really say what would make him to keep going, you know, to flee with her or to hold her against her will or to give her to anyone else. When he was taking her in the beginning, he always brought her back. She had nothing but positive things to say about him and his family. So, like I said, I don't know what happened to make him want to keep going with her. I don't know if he was trying to bring her back and somebody didn't want him to bring her back. And that's, you know, that's why he kept going with her because he was trying to protect her. I really don't know what was his, you know, was on his mind, whether he was trying to protect her or did he have other motives for her. Mm -hmm. So when Relisha was going to visit Mr. Tatum and she'd come back and be around you, she never said anything about the experience there or her behavior was not of the ordinary with her experience being with them. No, ma'am. She had nothing but all positive things to say about him and his wife and his family. Wow. So, so here's a question. How long has she been going over to the Tatum house? Um, for Because she was in the shelter for two years. So she went in in 2012. I'm going to say right a little after she had went in there because I didn't find out she was going with him until 2013. Okay, and as far as your knowledge of him, you don't, you ne- you never met him, or I never was- met him. I never, you know, they, I never known this man up until she went into the shelter. Wow. So at this point, um, wh- what do you know about her disappearance and you know the investigation? 
I really don't know any too much what's going on with the investigation because the law enforcement, they don't really be in contact with me or the family. Why do you think that is? I mean, do you think there's what do you think the issue is? I'm not I mean, I don't know if they found anything else and they don't want to share with the family or I don't know if they are closer to making any arrests or what the case may be. When I call, only thing they tell me is, well, um, we haven't gotten anything, um, but I'm going to have to, you know, connect you to this one or this one. You will have to talk to this one. That's what I get when I call. When you talk to your daughter about this, are you able to talk to her about it? And when you do, what's that conversation like? She don't talk about it. She jump around it. Do you know why she may be jumping around it? I mean, no. is it you? Mm -hmm. I really don't. And see, I, I mean, like I me, me, I, I don't know if everybody's aware, you know, of course, she blamed me for it, the disappearance of her daughter. And it took me to go on Steve Wilco's to clear my name, which in the beginning of the case, I had been telling them I didn't have anything to do with it. In fact, I got jumped by Shamika, her son's father and his mother because of this case there was some insinuation that you had something to do with her disappearance what did they say you had done they said i sold her uh her mother was like um my mother was supposed to took her to the emergency room but she never got there i don't know what my mother did with my baby you need to ask my mother and when they went up children's to see, they seen documentations where me and Relisha had been in the emergency room and then on the day in question. You know, I was doing a lot of research on, on this case and the story of the family, and it sounds like there had been some sort of um, abuse allegations like years before Relisha disappeared. What do you know about that, that situation? Well, to be honest with you, Shamika was never abusive to her kids. Never. She would get mad if other people hit her kids. Now, her two youngest kids' father, he was the abusive one toward the kids, not the mother. Shamika did her best to be a loving and caring mother to her children. And I mean, I admit she made some wrong decisions on who to trust her kids with, but she has, she was never abusive to her kids, physically, mentally, or verbally. So as far as the, the reports that's regarding, it was, I guess it was regarding from what I could tell, like the living conditions and stuff like that. So was, was your daughter kind of in, in just kind of a rough way of yeah. life, a struggle yeah. of life? She, she, she likes to help people and the people she tend to help not thinking about her children, the type of people that's around her children. She wouldn't put her kids first before she would help, you know, people, the people that she was helped was very disrespectful to her children, to her and her kids. While police were searching for missing Relisha, the story quickly took a bizarre and dark turn. On March 20th, just one day after Melissa said Relisha and Khalil made their last call to her phone, Khalil Tatum's 51-year-old wife, Andrea, was found murdered inside of a Southeast DC hotel room. Investigators do believe that Tatum was responsible and went on the run. Then on April the 1st, Khalil Tatum was found dead of an apparent suicide inside of a shed at Kenilworth Park and Aquatic Gardens in Northeast DC. But what do you think about the situation with uh, Khalil Tatum and him being got dead and then him, uh, you know, being, I guess, uh, they thought that he had killed his own wife. Yes. Do you start to think, think darkness at that point? It's hard for me to believe that he killed his wife because the reason why I say that, the average man that I know, well, that I heard of and that I know, when they murder somebody, they don't sit there with the body and wait for somebody to come and give them a ride. And that's what they said he did after he murdered his wife. And I'm like, why would he kill her and then sit there and wait for a ride when you got three vehicles out there in the parking lot? I don't mm -hmm. believe he killed himself. What do you believe? I, I mean, on his behalf, I mean, I can't, I can't, I don't even, I can't even say nothing bad about this man because I really didn't know him. Okay. So, you know, for me to say, have something bad to say about him, because at the, when, for me seeing him at DC General and hearing, you know, what transpired over the four and a half years, it's, it's, it, it, I'm still trying to put it all together like, 
is this the man that they say just killed his wife and himself? I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to put those pieces together. Because whenever he talked about his wife, it was all positive things. Yeah. I'm only thinking when you went to Steve Wilkos, there were some lie detector tests because I know that's what he does. Yeah. So what what happened with you? Did your daughter take lie detector tests? Who all took a polygraph? Me and Antonio Willow. Shamika refused to. But when she got back, she took it and she passed it. Now, who did she take a polygraph with? I don't know who. I think with uh, uh, one of these de- precincts here in the district, I don't know which department it was. I was just informed that the activists couple of the activists for my granddaughter had picked her up and took her down to the precinct to take a polygraph test. Do you feel in your heart that Relisha is still alive? Uh, I really do have mixed feelings with that one. I feel she's still with us, but based on, I'm going to say nightmares, I'm not even going to say dreams. I feel that she's deceased. I'm going to be honest. I I really do. There was an age progression uh, picture made. What do you think yeah. about that That one that came out? She looks like her aunt in that picture. Her youngest aunt. My youngest mm-hmm. daughter. The, the the age progression picture that they got on the flyer looks just like Relisha's 20... Let me see. 32, 31. 30, her 29-year-old aunt, Brittany. Mm-hmm. But I think they did a good job on that, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really do. I, w- no. I just... See, what I want, I want them to go back over to the park where they searched and they had the cadaver dogs. And I feel they need to go back and search that area because when the dogs was over there and I saw it, it wasn't something somebody told me. All the debris that they brought out of the water, the owner of the cadaver dogs gave them the command to sniff that debris to see if they had can find, you know, any death scent on it or religious scent. Them dogs would not go nowhere near the debris. They kept trying to get in the water by the wall. So that's so you think they have a sense that there was there's something in there? Yep. And and I've been trying for five years to get them to go back and really, really search that area. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, what what theories are, are rumors? You know, the streets always talk and say things. What, what were some of the theories that were floating around about what happened to her? People think they've seen her and different things like that? Or uh, Well, I had one lady who say she's seen her at Roll Out and Avenue. She looked terrified. And matter of fact, that lady who seen her at Roll Out and Avenue Station, she called me and I'm like, did you inform the police? And she was like, yeah, but I don't know what happened because once again, they never contacted the, you know, the family or got back to the lady who reported the sighting. Do, do you yeah. think that, do you think that there is a chance that she was trafficked? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. What, what do you want to say about any misconceptions or accusations made against you that you want to get cleared up? What would you want to clear up for people, for people to understand? I just want people to understand this grandmother here, the grandmother of Alicia Tanae Rudd, whom I truly and dearly love. I am one of the ones that try to protect everybody's child, no matter if they grown or, oh, I am a very overprotective grandmother. And I'm not going to harm nobody's babies because I love them with all of my heart. I love all kids. What what you were accused of selling her? You were accused of all I was these different things. Of selling her, I was accused of abusing her. I was accused of killing her and everything. And like I told them, why would I do something to my first and only granddaughter when her mother is the reason why I got her and the reason why her mother is here is because of me. So if I didn't make my first born disappear, which is Relisha's mother, why would I do it to Shamika's only daughter? The D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, Prince George's County, Maryland Police Department, and the FBI are all investigating this case. I reached out to the Metropolitan Police and they say they can't release details because the case is still open and there haven't been any charges filed in the case. They also want to let people know that they are following up on every tip and lead that comes in to their department, adding that they work tirelessly to bring closure to all of their missing persons cases and they treat them all the same regardless of age, race, gender, any of those things. There have been numerous searches for Relisha, some of them led by local DC activist Henderson Long and others in the community. 
Tell me about what you know about the state of the Relisha Rudd case and the impact on the community. Well, um, the case of Relisha Rudd, the impact on the community, it's devastated the community. It's a big hole in the community in terms of, you know, just a longingness and a, and a, uh, a desire to know what happened to Relisha Rudd. Um, Relisha Rudd's case involves suicide. It involves a lot of deception, a lot of finger pointing. You know, there's no real... Uh, concrete um, answers to the community. And so many people are outraged about the case just in terms of the failure of government, uh, failure of possibly the family, and failure um, on on the community's part to protect militia and to hear those uh, early cries, because there were early cries that the, the, the family needed help, that militia needed help, that her brothers needed help. So it's really impacted the community. Um, the state of the investigation, I mean, they basically taken any and all tips that come in. We encourage the community, if you know something, to text anonymous to 50411. That's the NPD's anonymous text uh, system. Or to dial 202-727-9099. They've taken all leads and all tips, um, and they actively investigate them and they take them serious. Considering the fact that Relisha has been missing since 2014, March of 2014 was when she was officially, I guess, announced as being missing. What have the efforts been? I mean, I know that you said you guys pretty much get on the street every day, every week, still trying to find her to make sure her face is out there. Tell me more about that. As far as um, awareness, we get out every day. We advocate for Relisha Rudd. We try to get a minimum of 200 flyers out to residents door to door, which meaning we bring that photo and that age progression photo to your door and put it in your mailbox. Um, we think we owe that to Relisha. We use the radio stations to, like um, National Relisha Rudd Day is a major day we set aside where we have a major effort. Well, we work with the transit police, we work with mainstream media, we work with podcasts, uh, we work with the various radio stations here in Washington, D.C. We try to get the community out. We go to 7-Eleven, which is, which is symbolic for July 11th, which is the date of National Relisha Road Awareness Day. Um, and we get out on that day. We partner with 7-Eleven. Various 7-Elevens that come, come and assist us by, you know, providing goodies for the kids. We might do a little bit of fingerprinting we might fill out some child id kits we'll get out there we'll pass our religious flyers um the police department is there uh, our local police department is there um the transit authority their police department is going to be involved the metro transit police department meaning the subways and the buses we're going to try to have her photo on their digital um boards that's out on the train well, so people see her um, age progression photo. Maybe they somebody might recognize her, you know, and call in. Um, so it's a lot of things that happen as far as us getting out in the community. This is really the uh, one of our most pressing cases. I would love to bring Relisha home or at a bare minimum bring her remains to the citizens of Washington, D.C. We owe it to her to give her a proper burial. If she, if she is deceased, we owe it to her to find her because she was dependent on people she was a child she trusted people you know she didn't have no other choice but to trust and i feel like so many people let her down you know child and family services you know i'm just to name a few who missed those warning signs you know we had a lot of family stuff that was going on that were were indicators that they needed more help than what they were getting and they didn't get that and this is what the end result can be sometimes. It usually wind up with a missing persons event or some kind of tragedy in the end uh, when we ignore those signs. Some have been focused on Anacosta Park and Kenilworth Park where Tatum was found dead and rivers near the shelter. Then in January of 2019, operating on a tip, investigators checked out some tunnels that Khalil Tatum had access to underneath the now closed D.C. shelter where Relisha's family was staying in search of her body, but they found nothing. And according to reports, that very site is set to be demolished in the near future. At this point, how is your family handling the situation 
right now. I mean, all these years have gone by, about five years now, and you guys don't have any clue as to where she is. How are you handling that? I'm not handling it. Me, grandma, me, number one grandma, it hurt, It affects me harder because when she went missing, she went missing on the 19th and nine days later, it's my birthday. You guys have seen, um, I guess, over time, you've had a lot of people. I mean, Relisha's picture is all over she's the place. Broke, yeah, she's, yeah, everybody loves my baby. I mean, if you knew her, you couldn't help but to love her. She is very helpful. Relisha is very, very respectful. And, I mean, she, at such a young age, she learned how to take care of her brothers. She was always helping her mom with her brothers. It's nothing Relisha wouldn't do for nobody. You know, if she see you having a bad day, she would put a smile on your face. When it comes to my final thoughts about this case, more than a few things come to mind. The mystery of where Relisha is continues to haunt investigators and the community and people all across the country, including myself. So why did she go missing? At this point, police believe that Khalil Tatum is responsible for her disappearance, but why would he hurt an eight-year-old girl? And if he did hurt Relisha and is now dead, how can the family truly get justice? And how is it that no one can pin down exactly where Relisha was for 18 days? There appeared to be a lot of finger pointing, so much so that the family went on national TV to take lie detector tests to prove themselves innocent. Is it possible that she was sold into sex trafficking? And what about the last phone call that Melissa said she got from Relisha and Khalil on the day before Khalil's wife was murdered? I have to wonder about what Relisha may have seen, and is it the reason why she vanished? And while there are reported sightings across the country, there's no solid proof that it's her. Some are even questioning if Khalil Tatum took his own life, and in reality, we're still no closer to knowing where Relisha is or if she's still alive, but some do believe that she is still alive. I also think about how determined the community is to find her and how people go out on a regular basis to make sure her face is not forgotten, and it won't be. Someone out there knows where this beautiful child is, and I hope they come forward with information. And right now, I have my sources checking to see if Relisha's mother, Shamika, would be willing to talk to me, and I hope she does. At the time of her disappearance, Relisha was four feet tall, about 75 pounds. She has brown hair and brown eyes. She also wore a purple Helly Hansen brand winter jacket and pink boots. If you have any information, call the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. They're offering a $25,000 reward for information leading to Relisha's whereabouts. If you have any cases that you want me to check out, just message me on the Intrigued Full Effect website or via email at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities in connection with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. Any copyright material in the podcast is approved by the owner or as part of the public domain. Music by Pond5.